everyone. Uh, this is our class material for November 4th. Uh, we'll talk about stellar evolution a little bit, a um, little bit about pre-main sequence, a little bit about main sequence, and a little bit about post-main sequence evolution. And we'll cover more of this on Friday. But what we're going to do here today in this uh, segment is we're going to talk a little bit about pre-main sequence evolution. So what happens as stars drop onto the main sequence, and that you this covers slides 1 to 11 in the PowerPoint. Uh, the first few slides there, uh, 1 to 3, talk about how we're going to use star clusters in order to do some of this work. And look at the HR diagrams and star, of star clusters to do this. And this is a lot of what we're doing in lab this week, so you'll recognize this from lab. Uh, there are two kinds of star clusters that we're talking about. We're talking about globular star clusters uh, that are half a million to a million stars, and we're talking about open star clusters that are a few, few tens to a few thousands of stars, roughly speaking. Uh, the open star clusters live in the plane of our galaxy. Our galaxy looks something like this. The open star clusters are dotted all along the plane. The globular star clusters live in a halo, around the center of the galaxy, like that. So um, they're, they're very different objects. Um, the globular clusters are uniformly old. Uh, the open star clusters have all kinds of different ages, and we're going to look at this as we move along. So you see pictures there. Slide one is a, is a photograph of a globular star cluster. Slide two is a photograph of a, of a nice, very rich open star cluster. And then you see a profile uh, diagram of the galaxy that looks like this, where we can talk about um, the, the center of the galaxy. As, we, as we're out here looking toward the center of the galaxy, uh, we see the globular star clusters and the open star clusters we see anywhere we look in the plane of the Milky Way galaxy, the hazy plane that we see on the sky. So we're going to start by talking about star formation. And the next couple of slides that you see there are, are really beautiful photographs of star formation regions. And so we got three of them in a row right there where you see what's going on in a star formation region is you've got a gas cloud. And so you've got a gas and dust, and it's just sitting there. Um, and it's in hydrostatic equilibrium, as we've talked about a few times uh, this semester, where the gravitational pressure wants to pull this inward. And the gas pressure, our PV equals nRT, or whatever we use right there, wants to push it outward. Those two things are balanced, and it's, it's, it's just sitting there, this cloud of gas. And what ha something has to happen to break that balance, to break that hydrostatic equilibrium. What that more often than not is, is going to be the shock wave from a supernova explosion, as we'll talk about um, on, on Friday already. We'll, we'll talk about that. And to say that you get this shock wave from a supernova explosion that comes ripping by here and compresses the gas so that the gravitational pressure wins and the gravitational pressure starts the collapse of that gas cloud downward. Now, typically that glass cloud is going to be spinning, and if it's spinning, uh, it's going to pick up, as we saw with the solar system formation that we talked about earlier, uh, it's, going to, it's going to speed up as it collapses. And so that rotation is going to, to grow in terms of angular speed, in terms of the speed at which it's spinning. And if it's spinning like that, it typically is going to flatten out into a disk, like we see with our galaxy up here. So we're going to, this thing is going to collapse and flatten out. If there's enough material there, it will make multiple stars. If there's not enough material in this particular gas cloud, it will make one star, uh, and it will uh, often make a planetary uh, cloud that goes along with it, a, pla a, a planet, uh, system of planets that will collapse, as we talked about with the formation of the solar system. So this thing collapses, it starts to spin uh, faster and faster and faster, and, and more likely than not, breaks into multiple stars. Um, if it doesn't break into multiple stars, and then it probably has enough material left over to make planets along a disk out here as this thing flattens out. And you see that actually in slide 8 is a demonstration of what, you, uh, of what happens right there. So, slide 7 before you get to slide eight, is the HR diagram of a very young cluster. And the HR diagram of a very young cluster 
looks something like this. Remember, we always have something that, that measures temperature on the horizontal axis, temperature increasing to the left, and luminosity increasing up this direction. Uh, there's our zero age main sequence that we're working with in lab this week. And you see there that the high mass stars are all on that zero age main sequence. But they start to walk off down here, and in fact, they're pretty far away from the main sequence. So we, we, we see with the low mass stars down here, they are falling onto the main sequence later, and they aren't there yet. And in fact, as we'll talk about main sequence evolution here in a moment and leaving the main sequence, what we're going to talk about, what we're going to find out there is that stars up here can be leaving the main sequence long before these stars have ever reached the main sequence. So these stars are moving this direction, and there's a diagram later to show you more precisely in the PowerPoint exactly what they're doing, moving more horizontally across here than what I've drawn. Um, and so dropping on to that main sequence to become stars. So while they're out here, they're not main sequence stars yet. Here they become main sequence, and as we talked about on Monday, uh, what makes a main sequence star a main sequence star is it's getting most of its energy production from hydrogen fusion into helium in the core. So down in the center of the core of the star is, is hydrogen is becoming helium, and that's the primary energy production in the star for a main sequence star. So if these aren't main sequence stars, but they're bright enough for us to see, they have this luminosity, where is that coming from and what's going on? So we want to talk about that a little bit uh, right now, is to say there are a few stages that this star will, will go through, and it starts as a protostar. So the protostar is still accreting material from this cloud. So we go back and look at slides uh, three, four, and five, and you see that cloud of dust and gas, that cloud of material. And so the protostar is a, is, a, is a lump of material down in here, and it's accreting material off of there. It's pulling material into itself right here. While it's doing that, it's heating up. Because we know, we've said many, many times during this term, that as matter falls inward under the influence of gravity, it heats up. You know, the technical term we use for that is the conversion of gravitational potential energy uh, into thermal energy. But, but really, what, just what we need to know is stuff expanding. If it's, if it's, if it's massive and it's, got, it's under the influence of the gravitational force, it cools down. If it's contracting, it heats up. So this protostar is heating up. So there's our protostar, and it's heating up. And it's heating up and, and, and accreting material. It's gathering material from the cloud. And that's what makes it a protostar. It can do that because this compression caused a denser core. And if you've got a denser core right here, it can be pulling stuff in. Now, at some point, it stops accreting material. And so when it stops accreting material, it becomes a pre-main sequence star. It's still not on the main sequence, uh, and it's still getting getting hotter, um, but it's, it's stopped pulling in material, or largely has stopped pulling in material. So a pre-main sequence star has stopped accreting, but is still contracting. So it's still heating up because it's still, it's still out of thermal equilibrium. It's still out of hydrostatic equilibrium. Uh, so it's still is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and so uh, accretions has stopped. It maybe hasn't stopped completely, but, but we'll say accretion has, has stopped, still contracting. And if it's still contracting, that means the temperature's still going up. Okay, so there it is, still contracting, still heating up. At some point, the temperature in the core reaches the magic level of 10 million Kelvin that we've talked about that you need for the fusion of four hydrogens into helium. And once it reaches 10 million Kelvin, then you become a main sequence star. So core, the very centermost part of the star, temperature uh, reaches 10 million Kelvin, and at 10 million Kelvin, nuclear fusion starts. That instant that nuclear fusion starts, you have a zero-age main sequence star. You've dropped onto the main sequence. 
Now, as soon as you're dropped onto the main sequence, some changes start happening, and you're no longer a zero-age main sequence star. You're a post-zero-age main sequence star. You're still a main sequence star, but you're starting to evolve a little bit on the main sequence. We don't evolve a lot on the main sequence compared to these other stages that we're talking about, but we'll talk about that in the next video. So, um, nuclear fusion starts, and when nuclear fusion starts, that's a main sequence star. And so, uh, that's, our, that's our path through uh, pre-main sequence evolution. You start as a protostar, you become a pre-main sequence star, and then you become a main sequence star. Now, once you become a main sequence star, uh, uh, the, the solar wind, the, the, the stellar wind turns on, and you start to blow away that cocoon that, that, that you were born from. So, so that star starts to clear out the rest of the dust and gas that you that you that that would that would have formed from. So we had this cloud here, and it created a bunch of material down here. There's still leftover dust, dust and gas out here, but this is this is now has a pretty significant stellar wind, and it starts to blow this stuff away and clear it out. And we really have a hard time seeing these newly formed stars. Um, and if there's enough of them there, uh, they'll make a star cluster. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. But we have a really hard time seeing these newly formed stars until they've cleared that area out a little bit. They've accreted most of the stuff onto them and blown away the rest of the stuff. And that's the process you see going on in slides 3, 4, and 5 in the PowerPoint, where we can actually see these, these really bright, hot new stars that are down in the core, and we can see the rest of the dust and the gas out here. They've created enough of a stellar wind to, to clear that area out and allow us to make it thin enough to allow us to see down through it, and it's going to continue to get thinner and thinner as they blow that material out into space, and these stars are starting to evolve. So that's, that's what's going on in the evolutionary path. We have one more idea we want to talk about with pre-main sequence evolution, and the, the idea that we want to talk about here and we're going to introduce the concept of the saltpeter initial mass function. Um, and we don't need to know the details of this, um, but this is um, the idea of how mass is distributed in the stars that are born. And so if you've got a cloud of gas that collapses into several stars, it doesn't collapse into to different sized stars randomly. It turns out it's a lot easier to make low mass stars than it is to make high mass stars. And the so-called Sol-Peter initial mass function suggests that the number of stars that you produce is proportional. We've been doing this proportionality stuff a lot, and we're just, we're just going to keep seeing how does this how does this sort of change? It's proportional to one over mass to the two point three five. Okay, so it says that the higher the mass, the fewer the number of stars because mass is in the bottom of this proportionality. And it's, it, it it's go, grows faster than the square of the mass. So, for example, if you take a suppose you got a cloud of gas and it makes a whole bunch of stars, it's going to make an open star cluster. So we just made an open star cluster out of a whole bunch of stars um, uh, that are forming out of this cloud of gas. And we want to ask, how are those stars distributed in there in terms of mass? What this tells us is a five solar mass star is going to be significantly less likely to be made than a one solar mass star. So we can stick five in here and say, what is five to the 2.35 power? So I just go to my, my calculator and I stick five in my calculator and I go up here to the x to the y, 2.35, and it tells me it's about 44. So five to the 2.35 power is about 44 and it says, that you will make 44, you're 44 times more likely to make a, a single, a solar mass star. So there, for, when you make a bunch of stars randomly out through there, you're going to find 44 solar mass stars for every five solar mass star that you find. So 44 stars the size of the sun for every single star that's five times as massive as the, as the sun. But there are stars less massive than the sun. Remember, the sun's a G2 star. And so K and M stars, uh, the, there are several classes of G stars, and then K and M stars are less massive than the sun, and we can say, what if you have a half solar mass star, a star that only is, is one half as massive as the sun? Well, let's put in the 2 there. 2 to the 2.35 is going to be, again, I'm just going to come in here and I'm going to say 2, x to the y, 2.35 is equal to 5. So there are about 5 times, so you made 44 
roughly speaking, that's that's a very rough thing, 40 to 50, let's say, 40 to 50 one solar mass stars for every five solar mass stars, and you make five half solar mass stars. So if we're making a table of how many stars we would see of various uh, masses, uh, we could fill this out smoothly across there. We could just plot this graph and have a nice smooth distribution, but we could say, ah, we just, we just looked at all of these stars that we made, and if we have one five solar mass star, we've got 44, again, 40 to 50, it's rough, 44 one solar mass stars, but there's five of these, and we're going to have 220 uh, 0 0.5 solar mass stars. So in our, in our star distribution that we just looked at right there, we'd say, yeah, let's just look at some, some simple model, and we'd say, ah, let's, in some area, we just made five, a, single, a single five solar mass star. We, in that area, we would have made 44 one solar mass stars and 220 half solar mass stars. So one of the takeaways here is that low mass stars are much more common in the universe than high mass stars. And as we talk about main sequence evolution next, in the next video, they're going to become even more common. Because not only are they much easier to make, they live a lot longer. Uh, they stay on the main sequence a lot longer. So the, the universe is dominated by low mass stars. Stars uh, of, of the size of the sun, a lot more common than stars bigger than the sun. And stars less than the mass of the sun, a lot more common than stars the mass of the sun. So that's what we got. That's our pre-made sequence evolution. We make low mass stars preferentially, and we do so by going through the protostar pre-main sequence star stages where we're accreting material in. And because as things fall in, we're under the influence of gravity, they heat up. We heat up the core, and we heat up the core to the point where nuclear fusion can turn on. And when it does, it becomes a main sequence star. So next, we'll talk about evolution on the main sequence. Thanks, everybody.